This is why Luke is prescribing for us, and he's prescribing, as does Matthew, that we live the things of life, that we not be conformed to idols, idols of silver and idols of gold. In our psalm, our introduction to the worship today, we talk about silver and gold idols, things that are voiceless, things that cannot speak for themselves, things that ought not to be worshipped because they have no power to save. They have no power to intervene with your actual life, as opposed to the life that you're living in public here today right now. Your eternal life is not going to be enhanced by these false idols. In biblical context, idols literally are known as powerless ones, pellets of dung, shameful things. And we all have idols. I know I do, because they're so convenient. The idol of having enough to be comfortable all the time. The idol of having too much to eat. The idol of security behind my police department and behind my closed door. And I know that I spend too much time looking at these false idols and living within them and doing everything I can to preserve them because they bring me comfort and they bring me protection, and they don't force me to be adventurous, and they allow me to ignore people who might be different than me, people who I don't necessarily want to get along with. They come from the silver and the gold, but that's all that they can affect, is that real world, the world of today, the non-living world, because idols are things they don't make us grow. I was thinking of this recently because of spring growth. If any of you have noticed, your lawns, your shrubs, your hedges are all taking over the world. And you're out there whacking away at them or hiring some strapping young lad in the neighborhood to do so, because if you don't take care of them right now, by the end of August, everything's going to look like one giant mass of greenery. I reflect on that while I'm mowing the lawn or pulling weeds or doing garden tasks because it strikes me that God is uniquely attuned to life. He will put life anywhere. He put life in the side of my house wall where there's a small green plant growing out of the mortar halfway up between the two upstairs windows. Who in the world thinks about putting a plant halfway up a house? God does. He allows life, real life, living life, to happen everywhere. In the harshest environments, deep under the sea, where sulfur springs grow from the cracks in the world's plates, there are bacteria and small creatures that live only on that sulfur. They only live two miles down in the ocean where there's no light. They have adapted uniquely to live there. God put them there or allowed life to be there, and life found itself and focused and grew there. On the Peruvian plain, as high as you can get above the earth without being in the stratosphere, where there is almost never any rain, where there is almost never any water, lichens grow on rocks. They're tough, tough things, but it's life, and it grows there, and it stays there. It's tenacious. It's real. It doesn't need an idol. It simply exists. There is so much energy in the world attuned toward life and the living that we can't stop it. We can't hold it back, though we try to. That is where I think I see original sin in the world. Let me share a memory with you. Reporters see a lot of very, very bad things. You see a lot of death. You see a lot of crime. You see a lot of injuries to people. But many years ago, when I was working as a daily news reporter, one of the worst things that I saw was a day spent at the Michigan Humane Society in what they charmingly refer to as the euthanasia room. I spent a day with them killing dogs, dogs that nobody wanted, dogs that had been kept in cages for weeks there and had not been adopted. And they were wonderful dogs. They were marvelous dogs. They were full of life. And they were so excited because they finally were getting out of their cage for a day, one by one. And they would come into the room, 
and some of them would actually offer a paw so that the needle could be put in the vein and they could be put to death. That is our flaw when we approach life and try to control it as people operating in a real-world system. This was the humane thing to do. There was an abundance of life in that room. Our only answer to it was to eliminate it. That was not a good answer. It is not a good answer still, but we are still doing that. We are still doing that. Though the life is ready to live, is ready to give, those dogs that day were ready to be friends. They were ready for people. They were ready for homes. We gave them a needle and a refrigerator. <laughs>